Hello and welcome to Classics Confidential. I'm Anastasia and today I'm talking with Lisa Maurice from uh, Bar Ilan University in Israel. Um, it's great to have you Lisa. Thank you. Um, and tell us a little bit about your work um, involving the popularity of the classics, the Greco-Roman classics, in literature written for children and young adults. What drew you to this subject? Well, there was a, a conference a few years ago, organised by, as it always, organised um, <laughs> by uh, Helen Lovett and Owen Hodkinson in Lambert, a wonderful five-day conference about children's literature and classics, which was a fairly... I've always been interested in children's literature, <laughs> so this was a good way to sort of enjoy myself at the same time as pretending to work. So that's really what I did, and I gave a paper there, and they have a book coming out from that uh, conference, uh, hopefully in the next year or so. Um, and it's something that's always interested me, and there's so much out there, and of course it's a new field. No one's been working mm. on this at all. And I feel anything to do with children is actually really very important, Indeed. because it's those children that then go on to be the next generation, and what are they bringing through with them? What are the information that they have and the pictures they have mm. of Rome and Greece and so on? So that's really how I got into it, and we just had a panel now at the CA on <laughs> classics and children's literature, and there's another one tomorrow, so uh, it's becoming a, a very up-and-coming area, which yes, is great it's, fun. Yes, it's, it's wonderful, isn't it? Yeah. When the thing that you are passionate about, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, gains in popularity. Definitely, and, and it seems to be very popular as well. I have mm. another book I'm editing for Brill, uh, in their Metaform series, also on the same subject. There's a conference in Warsaw in a couple of months. It suddenly <laughs> seems to be everybody's interested in children's <laughs> literature. I think we're all just big kids at heart, really. It's a chance to read all the books again and all the new ones that are coming out. So it's, it is very nice to see that popularity. Indeed. Um, I mean, the first sort of thing that pops into my head is uh, Percy Jackson. Right. Um, the Percy Jackson books. Um, uh, what uh, particular examples drew you to this topic? Well, of course, it was before Percy Jackson, more or less, when I first started. <laughs> and as a, sco a schoolgirl in England, everybody has to read Eagle of the Ninth. Rosemary Sackcliffe was required reading, which <laughs> basically kills it for most people. But I did actually, <laughs> yeah, yeah, as all these books we had to read, but I did enjoy it. Um, and I've always been an interest in, in children's books. And when I started looking at this, I mean, I, the, the Percy Jackson stuff is fascinating. Mm. But what I've really been working on in the last few months is Rome. Mm. Uh, simply because the field is so vast you can't really do everything certainly not in one go uh, and I was amazed at how much has been written um, mm. about Rome for children in the last in the last dozen years since 2000 really there's been this enormous explosion of course Caroline Lawrence the Roman mysteries mm. but many many other things as well vast right. numbers of books which nobody's been looking at so far so I get the fun of looking at it. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> so you often read some great uh, novels and That's then right. um, look for classical... And some terrible novels. And some oh, yeah. absolutely terrible ones as well. <laughs> Not to be fooled. Yes, yeah. It's so, all oh, great. Yes. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. It's all good for research purposes, yes. So what's the view of ancient Rome that we get from mm -hmm. these books? So there's... It depends when, when the books are written, but we do see some very interesting changes over the period. Um, in the 1950s, which was when historical fiction for children really took off, and the Eagle of the Ninth, 1954, and you have lots of writers after that doing the same kind of thing, um, or taking ancient Rome as their setting, very much a, a, um, looking at Roman Britain. As, ah, of uh, course, there's the connection here. Definitely, and all the big writers, Geoffrey Trees and Henry Trees, and all these all these people uh, uh, writing about Roman Britain. And in fact, uh, Catherine Butler and Halley O'Donovan have mm -hmm. a chapter in Reading Children's Fiction, I think it's called, about Rome. And they're mm -hmm. looking at the difference between 1950s and later on. And there's a very clear shift in attitudes. Yeah. Because in those days, of course, there's this colonialism going on and mm -hmm. the identification with Rome as an empire and the tail, tail end <laughs> of the British Empire, and that's us. And, <laughs> and really, the Romans coming was a terribly good thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's civilised us and so on, whereas that's not the picture you get at all nowadays. <laughs> the, the, we have the pure Celts instead, who were uh, wonderful people and perfect in every way, and you have these terrible, horrible imperialist Romans coming and taking everything from them, uh, which is a very clear shift. It's one of the, the changes that's very obvious. Um, so uh, that was one of the things I noticed. Another thing that's very interesting is also how many books nowadays have females as their ah, lead. Of course. <laughs> because it's a problem when you're writing historical mm. fiction, that girls on the whole in the past couldn't do very much. And you want to have a character that the reader can identify yeah, the female with. Female reader can yes. identify with. And this has gone on. Jeffrey Treese wrote about this and said how difficult it mm. was sometimes to solve these problems. So you get all these uh, ways around it nowadays, mm. where you have, for example, lots of books about royal figures, uh, Cleopatra, 
and uh, Boudicca, and they're, of course, able to do what they like because they're royal, mm. um, or they're Celtic, they're not Roman. Again, we have this... <laughs> of course, you're Boudicca, you're both. You managed to do two things at once, you do very nicely. Um, uh, and a great also, heroine here. Yes, of course, and, and something, a real strong figure, especially yeah. Boudicca, you know, this sort of brave kind of uh, <laughs> cartoon figure with <laughs> spiky red hair and like, ready to... You know. Yeah, and went against Rome, Exactly, <laughs> yes, and stood up for the, against these imperialist so-and-sos, yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> So there's all these kinds of social issues that are influencing mm. how Rome is, is portrayed very much. Mm. Uh, and of course all those other things that they see all the time, like gladiators and Pompeii mm. and, and all these pictures we have from TV and video games and films and gladiator and so on, uh, that are also colouring the expectations children have, and adults have of course, but particularly looking at children mm. when they come to read these books, mm. and the authors when they write the books, of course, of course, and the publishers when they're trying to sell them. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> I think this brings us very naturally into um, a discussion of the work you've done uh, about the representation of Jews mm -hmm. um, in film and in television series, uh, where again, sometimes the Romans are the villains. <laughs> <laughs> it's always a problem when you have, especially with the, the Jesus biopics mm. and so on, where you have the good guys who obviously got to be the Christians, and you have the bad guys who are obviously <laughs> going to be the Romans, um, and then you have this, these people in between where it's not very politically correct to blame them for anything, um, but they can't be the good guys either. And it's very also interesting seeing how different uh, uh, directors and so on have dealt with this problem throughout, throughout the ages, as it were, um, going right back to Cecil V. De Mille the first time mm. round, and the second time round, the... Uh, uh, all these these films that are really dealing with this issue. If you want to create a story of Jesus's mm. life, you have to deal with this issue. And who do you blame? And how do you depict the people? Mm. And we see a lot of uh, influences going on there at different periods. Mm. Um, in the in the fifties, for example, with the um, um, which one was it? The I think the greatest story ever told of George Evans. But you have a lot of influences of the Holocaust, for example, mm. a lot of imagery from the Holocaust. Yeah. Uh, with, um, it's still very recent, obviously. Yeah, very much so. Uh, and scrolls being burnt and, and lots of very strong depictions mm. of, of people being driven, uh, as it were, like, yeah, like sheep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and an imagery in words also, that you know, driven like sheep to the slaughter is a oh, phrase yeah. that appears oh, and so on. So, so that's a very clear yeah, yeah. the link with, with the whole That the Jews are the victims in that case, yeah. which means they're not really to blame for. Um, does it change that. sort of in the 70s and the 80s? Yes, um, they, it depends which you're looking at, obviously, but uh, one of the things I did look at was the miniseries Masada. Yes, I remember watching that yes. as a child. <laughs> <laughs> and of course they have to be the heroes there. Of course. Um, but again, the depiction is very much a, a influenced by um, what happened in Israel mm. and the state of Israel and Zionism and the belief that Israel is this uh, the different kind of Jew. Mm. Not the downtrodden Holocaust victim, but the one who can stand up and defend himself also against the freedom enemies. fighter. Exactly. <laughs> and very much very much depicted as cowboys, really, yeah. and the American ideal as much as the, mm. the any other kind of ideal, probably more so, in fact. Uh, I mean, there's uh, interesting things going on with the Romans, I think, in mm. that TV series, because you get, you know, some good ones, yeah. as well as, you know, the evil ones. Yes. Um, mm. How do you think that interacts with the portrayal of, um, of Jewishness? Right. I, I think there's very much a, an idea that... Um, it's very uncomfortable for the average American watching really at that period to think about um, imperialism as a terribly <laughs> bad thing because they have more in common mm. probably with, you know, with the, the, the odd Roman that's there than they do it. So the, what we have here, which is quite interesting in that miniseries, is um, the real evil thing is political corruption mm. and, and the emperor mm. and, and the... Uh, power um, mm -hmm. uh, hierarchy, if you want. Yes. But there are good Romans too, who are the good ordinary people living on the And we have the idea that you can blame the government really yes, yeah, for all those bad yeah, things. Yeah. We're terrible guys. It goes all the way really. to the top. <laughs> Definitely. It starts at the top, and, uh, yeah. and you can fight against it and be really quite a, a good person if you are. Still following those, those principles, <laughs> yes. Um, uh, more recently, um, there's been the TV series Rome. Yeah. Um, do you think anything has changed in terms of the portrayal of the relationship between Jews and Romans? It, it's very interesting that in the second series of Rome, there you have this thread of these Jewish uh, characters mm -hmm. running through it. Of course, it was meant to be developed far more with later series, but then oh, ran well. out of money, and yeah, <laughs> we're left with this rather thread that sort of goes nowhere. Uh, but you have uh, Timon, who's a <laughs> mercenary uh, is first shown having sex with one of the female characters and, and he, that's what he does as payment um, and it definitely doesn't have anything that makes him look at all Jewish mm. in, those, in that first series until practically the end and then suddenly he becomes Jewish or <laughs> is depicted as Jewish and everyone's recognising him as Jewish and, um, and in the second season that really comes to the fore when his brother comes from Judea who's this rebel um, and um, that thread is very much developed as, as Timon rejects mm 
the cruelty of Rome and the, the negative side of Rome and finds his roots uh, obviously meant to be leading through to going back to Judea and probably becoming Christian at some point, I would have guessed. Um, but, but there's a definite, uh, clear, depi- a very different depiction um, than you get earlier, where he's very assimilated, uh, really, uh, and you have this zealot brother who's there, but where, and we do sympathise with him, but the sympathy is much more for this man who's rather conflicted, really, mm-hmm. um, in, in where his identity is, I think, in that series. Yes, I mean, really, it's very much about identity, yeah. what it means to be Jewish, what it means to be Roman yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and where do I stand in a multicultural mm. world to a certain extent? Yes. Yeah. Mm. So, I mean, our impact, or, um, you know, the impact of antiquity is mediated through our modern concerns. Yeah. Um, do you think it, um, that it actually has something, this dialogue has something to say about antiquity? I think it probably does. Um, I, just one little point that I noted was I was able, when I was doing this paper about the about the Rome season two, uh, to interview um, the two oh, actors who played wow, the Jewish uh, characters. Exciting. Yes, we're so used to thinking, well, Homer's dead, we can't ask him what he thinks. Yeah, and yes. We sort of suddenly forget that these people are alive, and <laughs> we can ask them what they think instead of guessing. And um, that's one of the beauties of reception. Um, so I did, and one of the things that one of the actors played, one who wasn't Jewish actually himself, said that uh, the set for the Jews was built um, entirely separately as a sort of Jewish area within the set of Rome and they were very cut off from everybody else oh. and he said he felt that must have been what it was like really for a Jew in Rome mm. um, at the time. Now I don't know if that's true at all, I think I suspect that's uh, <laughs> actually no more true than it is nowadays or less or true or whatever uh, but I, th- I think that using the modern world to look back as a prism mm. Mm. Uh, can ask all these questions and raise this awareness and identity kind of issues mm. um, because we can see the comparisons and the differences in a much more obvious way, perhaps, than just looking at the modern world can. So I think looking back at the two, it can illuminate both directions, yes. No, I, I agree. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're planning uh, a conference in Israel, which brings up some yes. of these strands that we've been talking about. Um, tell us about it. Yes, very briefly, because I know we're running short of time, but it's a conference basically on uh, the reception of ancient um, virtues and vices in modern popular culture. Oh. So we have a panel, for example, on Jews in the modern world uh, as they're portrayed in these kind of things. We have panels on Rome, we have panels on uh, corruption, and sex and all these exciting oh, things. Oh, all these exciting Definitely. things indeed. So uh, yeah. that's 10th and 11th of June in bar University and Ben-Gurion University in Israel. Wonderful. Happy to have everyone there. Well, good luck to you. Thank Sounds you. really exciting.